Hello, I'm Douglas Evans, and along with Alexandra Katahakis, uh, we created Center for Healthy Sex as a resource for everyone around the world for greater uh, sexual knowledge and sexual health. And today, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly webinar series, uh, Sex Expert Series, today featuring Francesca Gentile. Uh, she will present us a very interesting topic on bridging sexual differences between partners. I'll mention more about her work in just a moment. Uh, Center for Healthy Sex uh, is here in Los Angeles and available to people from around the world in the form of our books, uh, webinars, YouTube videos, as well as we offer uh, services, clinical service, services for men, women, and couples in the form of individual couple therapy, group therapy, intensives, and Skype coaching on a wide variety of sexual concerns ranging from sex therapy and sexual dysfunction issues to couples relationship issues as well as sex and love addiction treatment and the support for partners of one who's addicted to sex. So we're happy to provide that work and always available for consultation by phone every day or through our website uh, inquiries and welcome any questions or uh, feedback you might have. We also offer extensive professional education through our lectures here at our center, as well as they are always filmed and placed on YouTube for your viewing from around the world, as well as uh, lectures and trainings in different locations, all of which are announced on our email channels, so feel free to reach out to us for more information. Uh, today, I'd like to welcome and present to you Francesca Gentile, and she's an internationally recognized presenter and expert on passionate monogamy, conscious non-monogamy, sacred eros, sacred kink, and the use of therapeutic tantra and therapeutic kink in healing from abuse. Francesca is an initiated shaman in four traditions, a clinical sexologist, ordained minister, empowered aging specialist, and relationship counselor. And she has presented at the Loving More Conference, the ASECT Conference, Sexy Spirits in New York, and La Tienda Rosa in Florence. And as well, in coming up in 2018 in Rome, she'll be presenting at a BDSM conference. She's the co-author of The Marriage of Sex and Spirit and the co-director of the Sacred, uh, excuse me, the Somatic Central Healing Institute and the Sacred Courtesan School of Feminine Mystique and Power. And Francesca is available through private counseling in person and by phone, as well as Skype and workshops and teleseminars. So I hope you gain a lot of uh, interesting new insight uh, by joining us today. And thank you for being here. And thank you, Francesca, for sharing your wisdom and experience with us. I am delighted to be here in the Center for Sexy for um, <laughs> Center for Sexy Health, right? The Center uh, for Healthy Sex. I, I like it both ways, actually. <laughs> And I just wanted to say to our listeners, to our watchers, to our viewers, that you can uh, chat your questions to me, and I love questions. And also, you can email them to charlie at centerforhealthysex.com. That's charlie at centerforhealthysex.com. Today's uh, topic is bridging sexual differences between partners and it's one of the, I think, most important topics. It's one of the ones that I see the most often as a sex and intimacy counselor. And it's, it's, it's something that I think we, we've all run into sooner or later, is that sense of my partner wants what? <laughs> or, you know, I'm trying to get them to understand what I want, and they don't seem to get it. So I want to start tuning into that issue. Uh, I want to say something first, which is all of us, if we think about our relationships, start to get together with someone based on what we perceive that we have in common and that sense of attraction. Often it's a sense of inevitability, a sense of either deep emotional contact or connection and or a deep physical attraction. But sooner or later in every relationship, that 
connection, both emotional and physical, will be challenged. Now, how might that be challenged? The first layer of how this is challenged is that our neurobiology of love and lust is pre-programmed to kind of dip after a certain period of time. In the beginning, when we first meet that person that uh, positively triggers us in some way, uh, I've never met anyone like this. I feel so seen. Every time they touch me, it's amazing. Uh, are things that we might hear in the beginning we actually have a series of chemicals that goes through our own body. Phenylethylalanine, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, adrenaline. And this is a higher high than anything we could smoke or take or shoot up. It's, it's just a higher high than anything. And it feels great. And because it feels so good, we wanna spend more time with that person that we perceive to be the source of those good feelings. What many of us don't know, and it certainly took me a long time to know myself, is that the source of those good feelings is in us. And there's a power there. There's a power there that we'll talk about in a moment. The source of those good feelings, the yummy feelings, is in us. The chemicals are in my body. They're in your body. And that person, might be a trigger for them, but they're actually in us. So some period of time down the line, it starts to be more challenging. I might say, you know, you're not listening the way you used to listen to me, or you don't touch me the way you used to touch me. I might start noticing that I have a lot more complaints then I have appreciations for my partner. And if we've bought into the mythology of how relationships are supposed to work, which is, you know, our eyes meet across a crowded room and and then it's all it all just keeps getting better and better. And then we make some sort of commitment or move in and it's we're supposed to live happy happily ever after. If we buy that mythology, then when the hormones start to drop, I will actually blame my partner. I will say, there's something wrong with you. You're not who I thought I was. Versus really recognizing, oh, this is a hormonal shift in me. What can I do to boost those uh, yummy, those yummy hormones again? And this is where the power comes in, is that we actually do have the power to boost those yummy hormones in our own mind and in our own heart and in our own thoughts. So why are we talking about this when the topic is bridging sexual differences? Because one of the main sexual differences, not the only one, and we'll talk about several, but one of the main ones is libido. So one partner wants to have sex more often and one partner wants to have sex less often. And this can end up being a source of suffering for the couple, a source of blame or a source of resentment or confusion. So let's say that's there. In some cases, the reason that one partner is experiencing this dip is just that natural hormonal drop. And when I learned this about myself, it was like the light bulb went out, went on over my head. And, and I recognized like, oh, then I have a choice. And I started to research how to raise my own libido in natural ways. So I was, let me just out myself and say that I was one of those people who would you know, fall madly in love. And then in a period of time, three months, six months, eight months, would start having these complaints about my partner and feel like they let me down and they weren't who I thought I was. And then I would justify sometimes having an affair. I would justify, you know, leaving them because they, they didn't do it the way that I thought they should or the way they did it in the beginning. 
And, you know, that was very destructive to a lot of relationships. So when I learned that I could actually access my own libido and learn to raise it or lower it, then I could create sustainable partnerships. Then I could actually choose healthier people rather than sometimes having to wait. Where is that person? It's going to turn off. It's you. You are going to trigger those yummy feelings in me until you're not. And then I'm really upset with you. And then I have to look again. So instead of having to go through that cycle, I could actually consciously choose who would be a good match for me. And then I could sustain arousal over time. So let's look at how we do that. One of the places that I studied was Tantra and uh, Taoist sexuality and also uh, research and books on the neurobiology of love and lust. Uh, we're really blessed in today's world that all this information is out there. And one of the things that I started to see in the research and in the practices was that every thought that we think releases a chemical trail. Well, what is a chemical trail? A chemical trail is a hormonal trail that goes through our body. And literally by thinking certain thoughts, by choosing my thoughts, I could start to elevate my arousal. I could elevate my uh, immune system. Uh, you can lower our heart rate. There's all these studies on you know, the conscious use of our thoughts and our breath. And what we see in Tantra, like when I looked at Tantra through a neurobiological lens, through a scientific lens, what I saw was that the practices that we learn in Western Tantra or American Tantra uh, actually are practices designed to replicate how we spontaneously feel when we fall in love. So we fall in love, that's spontaneous. We feel like we don't have any control over it and we don't have any control over it when it leaves. But Tantra actually thousands of years ago figured out how to support couples to feel that arousal, feel that love. So let's look at that, eye gazing. Eye gazing, when we look at someone's eyes and breathe together, it releases serotonin. It releases oxytocin. These are hormones that are the feel good hormones. They're the bonding hormone. They reduce our stress levels. They boost our immune system. They're also called the well-being hormones. So just eye gazing, just spending some time slowing down, breathing, seeing, seeing tenderly, compassionately into another person. Just that will actually open feelings of connection that weren't there before. This is how Tantra practices work. This is how, if you've ever been to a Tantra puja, which, is, which literally means ritual of worship, if you've been to a Tantra play party, this is how they work. You, you look into someone's eyes and you start to feel connected. Well, you could do that with your ongoing partner. <laughs> you don't have to do that just with a stranger. You can do that with someone that you actually know and have connection with. So we have the eye gazing. We have the breath. Now there's another thing about the breath that I really want to highlight for you that's just mm, so delicious, just changed my sexual life and those of my clients, is what's called belly breathing. So many of us in our modern culture, we breathe like this. <sighs> I'm kind of exaggerating. But if you see people breathing in a deep way, you'll see their shoulders go up and down. Uh, you might see their chest rise and fall. And what this means is they're actually not breathing into their belly. They're not breathing into the lower abdomen. And if we look at indigenous people, indigenous people automatically breathe this very deep way into the, into the abdomen versus this shallow way into the chest. When we're breathing in the shallow way, we get less blood flow. Uh, we actually feel more stress. It creates more tension in our body. It is, it is the enemy of delicious sexuality. So when we want to have uh, delicious sexuality, we, without you know, having to use drugs and alcohol, we want to 
relax the jaw. I'm going to do that now. Stretch the jaw, relax it. Ah. Hmm, that's good. And then I put, I'm putting a hand on my lower abdomen and I'm breathing into my lower abdomen and feeling that balloon of my belly fill up and then the balloon of my belly collapses. And then when I breathe in, the balloon of the belly expands. Breathe out, the balloon of the belly collapses. So not only after doing this a little bit, are, are we going to feel more relaxed? We're going to feel our muscles will start to relax in our shoulders and our back. But the really delicious part is that this belly breathing lends blood flow to the genitals. It's called the engorging breath for men and the lubricating breath for women. And it's just such a natural, easeful way to, to create arousal. And Tantra is a lot about arousal through relaxation, which is so great for long-term relationships, so great for uh, committed partners. It's something that we can choose and that we can choose to sustain. It's uh, much more difficult to keep the the high of the dopamine and the adrenaline going. Not impossible, and we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, a little bit more challenging. And they're, they're just different pathways. In a way, one is not better than the other. And in fact, you can combine them. So Tantra, we have that relaxation, slowing the breathing, breathing into the belly, looking into one another's eyes, uh, practicing either breathing together. We can do that you know, holding each other or cradling. Someone is in front of me. Uh, we can hold hands and do this and breathe in the nose and out the mouth. Or we can do opposite. I breathe in, you breathe out. Either way is really delicious and be the scientist of your own life to figure out which one you and your partner like better. So this is starting to choose arousal. Another thing, uh, that goes into both arousal and starts to get into fantasy. We all have our own fantasies. And I really want to invite us to bring in here that on the level of fantasy, everything is normal, everything is natural, everything is, is perfect. It's a fantasy. So on the level of fantasy, you know, we can we could fantasize anything and it's just it's just wonderful. And if you're listening, I really want to invite in, for the moment, separating out what I call manifest fantasies, the fantasies that we're planning to bring into actual life, and imaginal fantasies. The fantasies that we have in our own head, but we're planning to, we're planning to keep it pretty much in our own head. Maybe share it with a partner, but it's, we're not planning to actually do it. I separate this out for us because one of the issues that uh, couples come to me with is I don't feel safe telling my partner my fantasy or when I told my partner my fantasy, it, it ended up being a big argument or they were very uh, upset. And I wanna add in that if all, if we just add, sweetheart, I have this fantasy that's kind of like a dream. I'm, I don't think I ever wanna bring it into reality, but I just want to share it with you like I might share a dream. And I would love for you to just breathe it in like you would listen to a dream. And, you know, just just take it in as something that I'm sharing with you to be close to you. When we can separate out this is this is an image versus this is something I'm planning to act on, it has it be more easeful for our partner to listen. So once again, looking you know, is this an imaginal fantasy or a manifest fantasy? Uh, between us, how would you know? <laughs> how would you know if it's meant to be an imaginal fantasy or manifest fantasy? Well, this is where we want to bring in our frontal lobes. Our frontal lobes are where we have discernment. It's where logic resides. Uh, the reptilian brain back here is fight, flight, freeze, and fuck. Our limbic system is where we feel our emotions. This is where we can feel angry and 
a very disconnected, but it's also where we can feel empathy and, and uh, compassion and love. And, you know, both all of these levels of the brain are important. But when I'm trying to make decisions that will affect the rest of my life, I want to bring in my frontal lobes. I want to I want to bring in that discernment, that logic, that analysis that are the gifts of the frontal lobes or the neocortex of the brain. So when I'm thinking of imaginal versus manifest, I'm thinking, hmm, is how would this look in my day-to-day -day life? How would it affect my day-to-day -day life? Would it be uh, harmful to the agreements that I have with myself or my relationship? Would it create some sort of irrevocable damage because it's it's broken in agreement, so it's broken trust, or maybe it's uh, physically harmed my body in a way that you know I can't come back from. So really trying to think this through. One of my favorite imaginal, imaginal versus manifest fantasies is my pirate fantasy. And my pirate fantasy is I'm walking along the beach at sunset. The wind is in my hair. It's the perfect temperature. I'm wearing a long, beautiful dress. And in the distance, I see a pirate ship. And it's, and it's sailing towards me. And, and I see the captain and the wind is also in his hair. I don't know how that works since we're in two different directions. But the wind is in his hair and the sun is on his face and he looks so handsome. And our eyes meet. And I know that he's coming toward me. And he does. He eventually you know, gets in a little rowboat. He rows to me. He grabs me. He rows me back to the boat. And he ravishes me on the deck. Well, in my fantasy, my beautiful dress that I'm wearing is never harmed. At the end of making love, it's folded neatly next to my head, even though he ripped it off in the meantime. In my fantasy, I am not getting splinters from the deck of the ship. In my fantasy, I am not getting seasick, which I actually do. So if I was on the boat, I would probably get seasick and not actually be having fun. Uh, in my fantasy, the boat isn't stinky. In my fantasy, he hasn't washed, you know, he's, it, it, he's clean and, and not, you know, smelling as if he hadn't washed for three weeks or, you know, bad breath because he's lost his teeth and they don't brush their teeth at sea. You know, in my fantasy, it's all perfect. And I've had some boyfriends or sailors who, who when I've shared this, have even been excited. They're like, ooh, let me bring this fantasy into real life. And what I say is don't. Please don't. This is a perfect fantasy in my head. It is never going to live up to what is in my mind. So that would be an example of, of imaginal versus manifest fantasy. Uh, another example of that is one of my clients who, um, one of my clients who would have these fantasies of being cuckolded. And for those of you who may not know what that means, uh, he wanted to watch his partner making love to another man. And when we were unpacking this fantasy, I asked, you know, is there a particular time that it, that it arrives in your life? And he said that it only came up when his partner was breaking up with him. That when he had a partner that was breaking up, he would start to have these really powerful fantasies of watching her having sex with another man. And I asked him, have you ever heard of Eros and Thanatos? And Eros is the life force. It's not just our genitals. It's the ability to taste a piece of chocolate and go, mm, it's the ability to smell and bread baking and, and go, ah, it's, it's really the energy of vitality and, and aliveness throughout our whole body. And that has us, you know, wake up in the morning happy and feel excited about the day. That's Eros. And Thanatos is the death force. Thanatos is when we feel depressed when we just wish we were dead, when our life is going nowhere, when everything is just kind of feeling hopeless, powerless, that's the death force. And when trauma comes into our lives, we feel phantos. When actual death comes, when rape or molestation, when uh, trauma and relationships come, we feel that death force. And the mind is brilliant. The mind is just such a brilliant thing. So the mind actually brings arrows to phantos. So that's why it's really common to sometimes 
have a rape and then fantasize being raped because even if you hated the rape, like, why am I fantasizing about this? Because the psyche is trying to heal. The psyche is actually trying to bring life to something that feels like death. And so when I said this to him, I said, I'm just going to invite you to try on since you only have the fantasy. When you're a girlfriend of yours is breaking up with you, could this be Eros bringing itself to Thanatos? He said, my psyche is just trying to keep me from being too depressed when I'm grieving. And I said, yeah, I think so, maybe. You know, what do you think? And I'm not against you, you know, manifesting this, but what do you think? And he said, he, he said that felt right to him, that it felt right that, you know, considering that it was just coming at these times. Uh, there's two great books, one called The Erotic Mind, the other called Who's Sleeping in Your Head, that talk a lot about like where these certain types of fantasies will come from. Not all fantasies, by the way, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but where certain fantasies come from that are almost like a dream. They're, they're a symbolic message from the soul. And they're not meant to just go out and act them out. They actually have a message underneath where Eros is being brought to Thanatos, where there's some deeper message for us about why that fantasy, why does that keep coming up? I had a boyfriend that was a very disconnected in sexuality. And I'm more tantric, I'm more eye-gazing, I'm more demisexual, more loving, more, more romantic. And he wouldn't even kiss me when we'd have sex. And when we would have sex, this fantasy would just come into my mind of being in a church surrounded by cardinals dressed in red and, and then, you know, be, do, engaging in sexual acts with all these cardinals. And I'm like, why do I have this fantasy every time we're having sex? And I actually don't have it, haven't had it in other relationships. And, you know, what's up with this? And then when I brought my own analysis, my own, my own frontal lobe analysis to this, I was able to see, oh, it's Eros to Thanatos, but it's also the messages that I want more sacred. I want more of the sacred in my life. That was the church and the cardinals in our sexuality. I didn't need to go to a church and, you know, yeah, or have a bunch of friends dress up in red or whatever that is. So, so I'm not, you know, this is just one thing to look at. Uh, I want to bring up just a foolproof way to bring a fantasy into our life if we really want to in a way that will probably feel safe for ourselves and our partners and that is erotic hypnosis so if i actually wanted that fantasy with the cardinals or i wanted that fantasy with the 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 pirate on the ship or some people have snuff fantasies or something else you know our partner can you know breathe and relax and close your eyes and begin to you know walk toward your fantasy and begin to see this fantasy and feel it and you could they could be caressing you and pleasuring you while you're in, imagining this fantasy and it will feel like it's real sidebar neurobiological sidebar the body can't tell the difference between something that is act, vividly imagined and actually happens the body cannot tell the difference between something that is vividly imagined and actually happens. This is why uh, visualization and uh, drama therapy and inner voice dialogue and family system therapy and shamanic soul coaching and so many types of therapies work because they work interacting with the imaginal part of the brain. And every thought that we think, I said this earlier, every thought that we think is a, is a, is a, is a program of hormones and electrosynaptic pathways that's going through our brain. It's literally wiring our brain, wiring our body. And we do have a body mind, by the way. So outside of the brain, the largest congregation of um, neurosynaptic pathways is in the heart after there's 40,000. After the heart, there is, it's in our gut. After the gut, it's along our spine. So when we say we have a heart truth or we have a gut truth or we feel that funny feeling in our spine, it's, we can say that it's the body mind that is getting information and that we can actually rewrite the body mind. This is particularly great for those of us who've had trauma that 
the body is hardware and the mind are hardware and software. So we can actually rewrite our fears, our, our reactivity, our uh, sometimes our obsessive compulsive responses to certain trigger uh, situations or trigger words. If we choose, we can rewrite them. We don't have to, but we can make that choice. So erotic hypnosis and wonderful classes. You just Google erotic hypnosis. You can you can find classes, you can find books that will help you. And it's, it's really not all that difficult. So great, easeful way to start exploring with your partner. Uh, now, another thing that I want to say about how do we bring these things up to our partner is we want to bring them up from vision versus complaint. So complaint sounds like this. You know, you're not touching me the way you used to. And I just really feel like the spark is gone. And I'm, I'm not feeling excited in this relationship anymore. And I really feel like we need something different. You know, I've been having fantasies of other, of other men. I've been having these other fantasies and, and you really just need to let me have these because, you know, our relationship is boring. Um, that is a killer. That is just, you have just killed your relationship. You have broken trust. You have broken your partner's heart. Uh, don't do this. And it's very hard to come back from this. Uh, another, the, the preferred method of bringing up, uh, fantasies. And we have a question here about, uh, the threesomes. I'm just making a note of that and we'll get back to the threesome fantasy in a moment. Uh, but how do we bring up any fantasy with a likelihood of greater success? Let's try this on. And I call it speaking from vision instead of complaint. The first one, the one we don't want is speaking from complaint. Speaking from vision. I love you, honey. You're just the most special person in my life. I adore you. And you know, I've really been having a vision of bringing more joy, more passion, uh, more connection into our relationship. And would you be willing to brainstorm with me some ways that we might do that? And my goal is really to stay connected to you, to have a fabulous relationship with you, and to feel that, that juiciness with you. Which one do you think is going to be more successful? <laughs> and I've done both. I recommend the second. I recommend speaking from vision. So my vision is we're going to be closer. My vision is we're going to have this sexy, delicious relationship. Well, it seems to be delicious a lot today. <laughs> this, uh, this sexy, this um, passionate relationship, this enjoyable, connected relationship. That's my vision with you. And let's brainstorm. Let's collaborate because you're my partner. And here's some of my ideas. What are some of your ideas? If our partnership is, in fact, of primary importance to us, approaching these ideas as a collaboration rather than an ultimatum is going to be successful and healthy for the relationship. If I'm feeling that I need to approach you as an ultimatum, if you don't do this, I think our relationship is over or heaven forbid a threat, if you don't do this, if you don't agree to this, I'm not gonna have sex with you. Once again, we've just killed the relationship. It's a matter of time. The relationship is now in its death throes. It's just how long are we gonna let it, you know, kind of gasp for air before it finally expires. So we want to speak from vision. We wanna keep the connection between ourselves and our partner as a primary importance if at all possible. There's a different issue if our partner, if we've tried everything and our partner, partner is unwilling or unable, that's a different issue and perhaps a different webinar. Uh, but in this webinar, we're looking at bridging sexual differences. Uh, and okay, um, how do you handle fantasy after infidelity? Great question as well. Um, so in terms of uh, the threesome fantasy, very common. I, I, I have to say that I've rarely met a heterosexual man that doesn't have a threesome fantasy. And when we look at this, it's also, it's almost like a cultural phenomenon. I can't say this around the world, but I can say this for the United States. And what might drive this cultural 
me is I often think of fantasies as trying to give me a nutrient. So if I have a fantasy that's very adventurous, then maybe adventure is missing in my life. If I have a fancy, fantasy that's very romantic or sacred, maybe sacredness is missing in my life. If I have a fantasy that's raw and rough, maybe my my primal, you know, that animal in me is wanting more of a chance. You know, so I think of the fantasy as, as bringing the nutrients to me. And, you know, I also, I had a fantasy of being surrounded by women. Uh, it was right after I had my child. And I was imagining making love to women and being surrounded by women in an erotic way. But when I looked at it, I thought, oh, I just really want to be surrounded by women. I want to be nourished by women. I want to relax into the feminine. And often if we have a drive, like a fantasy that just keeps coming back in a very driven way, we want to at least look at what might be underneath that. And it's my perception that our culture is less nurturing than many other cultures, less affectionate than many other cultures, and that there's almost a, a core need that ends up being unfulfilled because we have a core need to be seen, felt, and heard, a core need to be held and touched, a core need to feel like we matter, and that those core needs are often very, very missed in the masculine, in our culture. And so there's just this profound need, I think, that, that comes up in this fantasy of if I could have two women, if I could have two sets of arms and two sets of legs and two sets of breasts and just really be surrounded by the feminine, maybe then I would be nourished. Maybe then I would be complete. And, you know, it, it's not bad. It's not wrong. It, it might even be fun to do. But if we're clear about what what is the actual goal, if I think the goal is to create some sort of porn film in my head and then check it off and go, yay, I have somebody who's had a threesome, you know, that that might be less fulfilling than if I have a clear intention that says, you know, I think that there is part of me that that wants to be surrounded by the feminine, that wants to relax into the feminine, that wants to feel like my whole body is being held on every side, and that that's not just my adult that's longing for that because also my teenager so many men that I know feel so much wounding in how they come into their sexuality they feel that it was shamed by their family by uh, what they see in media by other girls uh, by other men and you know so it could be the teenager that needs that it could also be the little one you know the younger self and there's a lot of men that I work with it can be a wounding to even think that they have a younger self that the masculine um, identity that our culture upholds, and there's a film called The Mask, The Mask We Wear, that I highly recommend for men and women to watch. There's also a TED Talk by Ted Porter about the man box. And not everything that's faced can be changed or healed, but nothing can be healed or changed if we don't face it. And if we want, especially our masculine, to feel whole, to feel able to receive beautifully, to be able to take it in, to feel more more fulfilled and less hungry, hungry, hungry all the time. If that's what we want for our masculine or for ourselves as, as a recovering spectrum love addict, I know what it's like to be hungry all the time. Um, if that's what we want, then we need to face the way that our culture traumatizes the masculine. And one of the ways it traumatizes the masculine is by saying, you have to be a stud muffin. You have to always want sex. If you don't always want sex, there's something wrong with you. If you're not completely skilled at sex without anyone ever having taught you anything, there's something wrong with you. If you have to ask about sex, there's something wrong with you. If you're vulnerable in life or in sexuality, there's something wrong with you. All of those messages are so toxic, so wounding for the masculine spirit and are in the way of the masculine being able to receive. Uh, so uh, do I think that threesomes can be beautiful? They can, or they can be terrible. Uh, I have my own data sampling of about a dozen, and some have been uh, beautiful, and some have been, oh my God, that was a disaster. And it's not just inherently beautiful. Once again, it, it all works in your fantasy, but that doesn't mean it's going to work in reality. And if you're even going to try to have a threesome, 
I recommend, once again, speaking to your partner from vision. I want to feel closer to you. And I also recommend letting the women leave. The best, fanta the best threesomes have been when my male partner has said, you women are in charge. And I'm just here in awe of your beauty. I'm here in wonder of looking at the both of you. And you don't even need to include me, but if you do include me, that's beautiful. And when there's that much spaciousness, then we females feel so generous and then we can bring the partner in. But if the if your long-term partner feels any risk to your connection, if she feels like you're treating the new woman like a new toy, like the new interesting thing, it's going to break her heart. It's going to ruin your relationship. No good will come of this. Uh, another way that sometimes works is to, you know, literally set a timer and say each person is going to get 10 minutes, 15 minutes of being the center. And in your 15 minutes, you know, you get to ask for what you want. And within the boundaries of the givers, they will give it. And then you switch. And that's uh, a way that it might feel fair. But if we're doing a threesome with um, two men and one woman, I always feel that the primary partner really needs to have the dominant say because they're the one that is feeling the most fragile. They're the one that's feeling the most frightened uh, in most cases. So whoever really is feeling the most frightened, uh, but it's often the primary partner, really needs that support to guide, to be, um, to have their needs put in place. And you know, I recommend too, if there's fear involved, then maybe the first threesome is just eye gazing. You know, eye gazing and hand holding. It doesn't go to anything more erotic than that. And just see if people can handle that. Or maybe, you know, you're leaning back against two women and just being held and just seeing if you can breathe in, breathe in that love, breathe in that attention without it even going to anything else yet. Uh, in my own personal life and in the life of my clients, I find that if we rush, it's kind of like eating the candy. If I rush and eat the candy bar, I'm, I'm never fulfilled. And if I slow down and you know chew my food 25 times and you know really um, let myself put on beautiful music, I can feel so full. Well, sexuality is the same way. We want to slow things down, especially if we're trying to really breathe in that our fantasy is being fulfilled in reality. We want to really let that come in rather than feeling like, oh, well, that, I mean, now I need another one. Now I need another one. Now I need another one. Because we actually were never able to receive what was there to begin with. Um, and with regards to fantasy after infidelity, one of the things I want to bring up is fear versus fact. This is true in all of life, but it's especially true in sex. It's a little bit between the manifest and the original is to learn together, um, can we tell the difference between fear and fact? And I often feel that couples, and even in myself at times, start to get all wound up about the fear that something's going to happen, a, a future anxiety, so that we're not present here in the moment, we're not able to be in love, we're not able to be in connection. And I recommend, uh, there's a lot of personal growth courses out there for that. I recommend, recommend non violent communication that's www.cnvc.org uh, when we learn non-violent communication it helps us stay in the present and not a fear fantasy uh, i recommend uh, there's landmark education there used to be life springs there's other ones that help us get out of you know separate out fear versus fact story and narrative versus fact and when there's been an infidelity, there's a tendency to go into fear fantasy. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. I can't trust you. Oh, my God. And then if you bring up a fantasy to me, I've collapsed, you know, imaginal versus manifest. I'm thinking, oh, my God, then you want to make that happen. Oh, my God, I'm not safe. And we want to rebuild trust in the couple where they can share fantasies without necessarily feeling like you have to go out and make them happen. Or you can, in fact, do erotic hypnosis together and, and have them happen that way versus having to go act them out. When there's been a uh, infidelity, 
it's very important to look at why and what was the breakdown in individually and in the relationship. We often find uh, when I was someone who cheated, one of the reasons that I cheated was uh, I actually didn't think that I had the right to fully tell my partner what I wanted or needed. There was a deep wounding around my own uh, voice and around my own uh, valuing my capacity to speak. Uh, another reason I cheated was because I didn't know that the hormones will always come off, they'll always drop, and I thought it was my partner's fault. So then I justified that I could get a new high. I didn't recognize that I was treating people like a fix, like a drug. And um, those are, for me, those are probably the main reasons. Uh, but for other people, they might be different. It could be a trauma from the past. It could be, uh, uh, you know, something else. So the person who cheated, you know, we want to support them to look at, you know, what was underneath. And in many cases, it was far less about what my partner was doing or not doing and much more about my own wounding. But on the other hand, the partner might look at something too. They might say, how did I make it unsafe to speak to me? This is something I also realized is that I want my partner to speak the truth. But sometimes I don't make it safe for them to speak the truth. So if my partner is sharing a fantasy or that they find another woman beautiful or they're sharing something, I'm like, oh, oh my God, how could you? And I get all upset. I have now taught them in a way to lie to me. So I also need to take responsibility. Am I creating an environment that allows my partner to feel safe to speak to me? And do I have issues around my own self-worth or self-esteem that I need to heal in order to support that my partner can tell me some fantasy? So ultimately, uh, infidelity can be an opportunity for the couple to go deeper. And one of the books I recommend for this is uh, The Future of Love by Daphne Rose Kingma, who talks about that relationships always start off in um, romance, and then there's the crop crack in the vase or there's a little problem they're trying to fix and then eventually there's a struggle and chaos and then if they stay in it they eventually get to uh, tr transformation and surrender and she has examples of infidelity couples and how they've gotten closer to the infidelity that they allowed that to be an opportunity so there is that potential uh, and I'm just looking here uh, my partner and I are at a place of frustration where we are both decidedly kinky and have explored a lot in the past. At this point, I want more commitment as a means of feeling safe and playing deeper, and he wants more kink to allow him to feel agreeable to more commitment. Uh-oh. Uh, I think they call that uh, a vicious circle uh, with teeth. And once again with this one where... Uh, there, you know, when I see this couple, that there's many things they have in common. They're both kinky, they both want commitment, but they're in a power struggle right now where one is saying, I'm not going to give you this unless you give me that. Uh, and once again, that's destructive to the relationship. So we want to see, I recommend, uh, dear hearts, eye gazing. So this is what, I, what I'll do. Is I'll say to my partner, can we schedule a time to talk? And my intention in the talk is so that we can feel closer, that we can be more connected, that we can brainstorm together some ways that it'll work. At that talk, when we're there, now we've scheduled it, we've agreed. At the talk, I make sure there's food and water so there's no low blood sugar. And again, I invite us to spend a little time looking into each other's eyes with compassion, maybe say some appreciation. I really appreciate that you've been here with me that we have explored so much together. I appreciate it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we share some appreciation. We speak our intentions for the conversation. You know, the highest and best intentions, you know, closeness, intimacy, et cetera. And then we light a candle. And we keep the conversation very slow. And we do a lot of reflective listening. So if my partner says, you know, I'm afraid that if I give you more commitment, that it'll be a trap and we'll never have more adventure, we'll never have more exploration. Then I want to say, let me breathe that in. What I think I hear you saying is that 
that you're concerned that the commitment could end up being um, constraining for you and that, you know, even the betrayal and that your need for, you know, adventure and learning individually as a couple, you know, won't happen if that close. And if he says yes, then, you know, I, then I could say, well, would you be willing to hear what it means to me? You know, what it means to me is, and so you're keeping it really slow. And then you say, what it means to me is an opportunity to form even deeper connections so that we can explore further. What do you think you heard me say? And so you just keep checking in. Are you each hearing accurately? Because when, when our limbic system and our reptilian brain starts to get activated, we can go into deeper empathy or we can go into that fight, flight, freeze. We can actually start to hear our fears versus actually hearing each other. And so that's why we want to keep these kinds of conversations very slow, very gentle, hold the intention, the positive intention, breathe, relax the jaw and the belly, breathing down to the earth. This helps keep us out of that fight flight. And um, this is why some people go to counselors and therapists. It's the counselor helps hold that container, keep it slow, and make sure you're hearing each other accurately. Uh, this is why some, some of us study nonviolent communication, because that also gives us the skills for that. So I, I really see a lot of hope for the two of you. It's just a matter of uh, making sure that you're able to keep slow. Uh, how do we re retrain ourselves towards relaxing into intimacy after trauma? Mm. So intimacy after trauma, because that can be another bridging of sexual differences. I, I, I know we're getting so close to near the end. There's so much to share. And, and working with trauma is, is also a whole... Um, is a whole webinar, which I, I love to address. And uh, one of my specialties is working with trauma. Uh, but one of the things let me add for everybody that I think helps is that we are more than one thing on the inside. So here's Francesca, right? I look like I'm one person. But inside Francesca is actually a multiplicity of inner aspects, inner archetypes, inner persona, whatever word you want to use. And so inside me is that primal, that animal that kind of goes tasty or not tasty. And it has really instant responses to food and scent and color and sound. And that's a part of us. And that's a part of me. It's a part of you. And inside all of us is actually all the different ages. It, it shocked me when I learned this is that my body was getting older. But inside me was still this like little girl that was like, do you like me? Am I safe? Do you like me? Am I safe? Am I safe? Do you like me? And that little part of me was absolutely driving um, my sexuality. It was confusing to people because on one hand, I'd be this really sexy primal, you know, like biting and clawing and super passionate. And then the next moment I'd be like, oh my God, no, like I'm really scared and we have to stop. And, and it was confusing to me and other people until I learned it's like, oh, they're both parts of me. And they each have a voice, they each have needs. And I need to develop an adult integrating self of queen of the kingdom, a king of the kingdom, a ruler of the realm to be able to listen to these voices and mediate between them and advocate for them in a centered way versus a reactive way. This changed my life and changed the way I work with my clients. It's just been huge. Inside each of us is oh, something wise that gives great advice to other people, often not to ourselves. Inside each of us is male and female. Inside each of us is, uh, is so much. And each part of us, each inner aspect, each inner archetype makes love differently. And so I work a lot with couples on starting to explore and unpack who's on the inside. And they end up discovering much more erotic flexibility than they ever thought was possible. But then we also find out, you know, who are the frightened parts inside and who are the angry parts inside and who are the hungry parts inside. And let's make sure that they're being heard too. So they're not just being suppressed so that they, you know, act out somewhere else or they sneak out somewhere else. Sweet consciousness, you know, heals so many things. 
And in trauma, some of these younger selves are just carrying huge amount of sadness, huge amount of distrust, huge amount of fear. And trying to step them down isn't going to help. We actually need to meet them and address them. And ultimately, I need to meet and address and love my own. And when I know these parts of me, I can create um, evenings or scenes with my beloved that are consciously healing towards these parts, very consensually and very consciously. If I try to uh, get healing for these parts of myself unconsciously, I don't have consent from my partner, and then things can really blow up. This is one of the reasons why we want to unpack our fantasies and kind of go underneath, because then we can get more conscious consent around what we really need to have happen at the um, threesome or you know in the pirate fantasy or whatever because it is a nutrient usually underneath that wants to be nourished. And the more we can bring consciousness or there's a younger self or a different part of us that really needs to feel seen or feel heard. And if we can reach that, the experience becomes so much more powerful, more healing, more nourishing than if we're just acting out unconsciously because it, 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 it's a fantasy that comes up, it's a desire that happens. How do couples handle one person being on the low libido side and one being high. Um, yeah, um, one has very high drive, always wants sex. The other really thinks about that. One feels they have to depress the high drive. So um, we talked about that a little bit in the beginning where if someone has access ever to a high libido, maybe in the very beginning of a relationship, that there are ways through practicing Tantra, through practicing breathing, go back and listen to the beginning, that help us uh, feel the arousal again. So for the lower libido partner, sometimes we also want to look at what are they drawn to. Maybe they're not drawn to boom, 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 penetrative sex. Maybe they're demisexual or they really need relatedness and emotional intimacy. Are they romantic sexual? Are they something else? So what are they drawn to? And starting to see what the access point is towards intimacy for them. Uh, I will also say that, uh, once again, this, there has to be consent here, but uh, oxytocin is one of the things that builds a sense of well-being and a sense of arousal. So if people are willing to relax the jaw belly, breathe into the abdomen, and we talked about that in the beginning, and then be caressed very slowly, like slow, fairly light caresses, you know, around the whole body, not, not going for the genitals, not going for the breast or the anus, but just caressing the entire body. You want to put slow music on 15 to 20 minutes. Usually that builds enough oxytocin that sex becomes to sound like a good idea. So an example is tired people, new mothers. If you had asked me right after my child, uh, did you, uh, are you in the mood for sex? For like probably about a decade, I would have said no. But knowing this, this kind of slow caressing, the eye gazing, if my partner was willing to do this for 15 or 20 minutes, it awakens the body. You want the receiver to just be relaxing the jaw and belly, breathing into their abdomen. They can fall asleep if they want to. And usually after a little 15 minute nap, they wake back up and, and sex feels like a good idea. It's, it's coming to the body through utilizing the neurobiology of the body rather than coming from the brain and the brain might say, I'm not in the mood. Now the person that has the high sex drive, um, that would be something that I would want to invite you to look at. What is getting put into sex? So for me and for a lot of people and a lot of my clients, under I want sex, and it might just feel like that hunger. You know, I want sex. I want more sex. I'm always in the mood for sex. You know, sounds nice. Um, but underneath that need for sex is often also the need to matter the need to be touched, the need to relax. I mean, sometimes after a good orgasm, some of the best naps I ever have. You know, the need to relax, uh, the need to belong. Uh, I think I said touch. 
uh, the need to matter, the need to feel successful, like underneath that hunger can be all these other normal human core needs that are being in placed under sex. When I say I want sex, I want all these needs fulfilled. And because we've all experienced, right? Going boom, 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 having an ejaculation or an orgasm, and then kind of going, hmm, that wasn't as fulfilling as I liked. Um, something still feels a little empty. And then thinking if I have more, it's kind of like if I have one candy bar and that's empty, let me have 10, maybe that'll feel better. And it doesn't. You know, I could do it again and then be like, hmm, still feels a little empty. But when I recognize all the needs that are under I want sex, then I can start to advocate for some of those needs. I can start to advocate for um, intimate conversations or being held or um, revealing my heart or having them reveal their heart. And it's not to say that I wouldn't still want an orgasm or that I wouldn't still want arousal, but it I might feel a little less uh, driven. And I might also, in being able to ask for those other uh, requests, when I do have sex, I might feel so much more fulfilled because I'm getting almost like multi-level sexuality, not just what I call candy bar sexuality. Uh, I want to talk, we, we're almost out, and I'm just going to run just a couple moments to say, because I can't leave you, I can't leave you, without talking a little bit about dopamine and adrenaline. And when we, um, and I just want to say one thing, write to me at relationshipdiva at gmail.com. That's relationshipdiva at gmail.com. Um, say, write in the subject, uh, gift bridging sexual differences. And I will give you some documents on some of this. And also for those of you who wish, I'll give you a free hour phone coaching session. Yay. <laughs> so, but dopamine and adrenaline are also what we feel in the beginning. They're and dopamine is anticipation and reward. It's that, am I going to be able to touch them? Will they touch me tonight? Am I going to see them? What's going to happen? It's dopamine is in gambling, it's in going to sex parties, it's in fantasizing about something, it's in shopping, it's anticipation and reward, and adrenaline is that sense of risk. You know, it's like, oh, our hearts are just really beating. And some of us really like dopamine. Some of us like dopamine and or adrenaline. And for those of us in a long-term relationship, what do you do? Uh, in that case, that, you know, saying, oh, you know, tonight I'm in charge and dress in a red thong or whatever. You know, it's like kind of giving a little hint, but not too much. Uh, having the person start to feel that anticipation again. Going to sex parties, even if you don't um, interact with anyone else, just the idea that you're going to a sex party starts to have the dopamine and the adrenaline going. And certainly in the world of pink, uh, the, the anticipation of the scene the preparation as you're putting on your outfit or going to the party, all of that builds adrenaline and dopamine. And so that's a way to keep some of that going in a long-term relationship. Uh, and one of the things that I find the most, uh, has the most hope for differences between couples is, as I said, learning the neuro neurobiology of love and lust, taking it out of this place of powerlessness, learning how the body actually works, and knowing that you can work your body that way. You can work your body that way. And the inner aspects, inner archetypes, learning that we have so much more flexibility. I want to, than we ever knew we were capable of. I, I want to thank you so much for being on this webinar with me. I want to thank the center, um, the center for healthy sex. I always want to say for sexy health. <laughs> the center for um, healthy sex for inviting me. And once again, please email me at relationshipdiva at gmail.com. This is for the documents are for everybody. The free session is for new clients. 
And also, I will be giving you information on, um, you mentioned trauma, uh, a four-day um, somatic sensual healing that some of you may want to participate in. And I will give you a discount for that. And for um, some of you who want to heal and travel, uh, an eight-day in Sicily in autumn of 2018. My mission is to create a world in which sexuality is experienced as a blessing. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share with that with you. Mwah.